Amen. Amen. There's nothing better than getting to preach at Easter time. I'm excited. I'm excited to be able to open the word. Will you take a seat wherever you are? Thank you, team. Sorry for springing that on you. You did it without flinching. But awkwardly, I wanted to sing along, but I didn't trust Adam to have turned me off. So I couldn't. It looked like I was saying I was just mouthing the words in case you all were subjected. Do you know one of the things that God's going to do for me when I get to heaven is he's going to make me able to sing and dance. But for now, <laughs> while we live on this fallen earth, this is, this is how I am. Hey, we're in the middle of an awesome series, coming to the crossroads, coming, as the Bible tells us, to the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified. And looking at everything that happened on that Friday afternoon 2,000 years ago as the Son of God, the King of Glory, submitted himself to the cruelest of all deaths and hung on a cross for you and for me. And we're coming to this crossroads and just trying to understand there's so much that we need to learn and get from this scene, the Calgary scene portrayed by so many people over the past two millennia. So many artists, so many people have tried to convey this scene, tried to help us to understand what went on. And we come again to it this Easter season, coming to this crossroads and examining ourselves, looking inwards, to try to determine whether our lives are properly reflecting the majesty of what happened at the place of the skull. And so we're going to come, we're going to read from Luke 23. This week I was preparing, and in our little kind of office space that's set up in my wardrobe, I had my Bible out and my papers and stuff, just trying to sort through what I was going to do. And my little girl, Lana, she's six. She came in and she sat on my chair and she got my big Bible. I've got one of those big Bibles, a home Bible. This is my, this is my little fit-in-the-back pocket Bible, but I've got a, I've got a proper Bible, a leather-bound Bible. One of the ones that when you whack it down, a cloud of dust comes out, that, that kind of Bible. And it was open, open on the desk, and she picked it up and balanced it on her lap and started to read it. But she's P1, so her reading is very Biff and Chip. Uh, not, not, so much, not so much with Golgotha and crucifixion. But somehow she knew that I was, I was prepared. She must have seen something that knew that, I was gonna be, that it was open to the cross. So she started to tell the story. And she said, Jesus was on the cross, and he was being crucified in France. Lana, where's, where's Jesus being in France, Daddy? So, come with me to the Dordogne, and we'll, uh, we'll read the story. Luke chapter 23. It wasn't in France before anyone reports me to Pastor Ian. <laughs> right, where are we starting? I think we're starting in verse 32. I want to start in verse 32 anyway, if that's okay. Luke 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. And they came to the place called the skull, and there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive all these people. They don't know what they are doing. And they, the soldiers, divided up Jesus' clothes by casting lots. And the people stood watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely, this was a righteous man. And all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place. They beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Jesus, we're in awe 
of who you are, of what you've done for us. And we're before you this morning asking that you would show us something of the magnitude of your sacrifice, of what it means for our hearts, and of how we might live in light of what you've done for us. Father, take my feeble words, anoint them with your Holy Spirit, and let them be meaningful and helpful. And for every heart, every ear across this room, I pray that we would all be open to hear what you want to say. Only, we only want to hear you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today we're at the crossroads of humility. The crossroads of humility. But to talk about humility, we first have to talk a little bit about pride. And you may or may not know this, but pride is the OG of sin. The first sin, the foundational sin, the sin that sits under all the other sins is pride. The Bible tells us that Satan himself was an angel and because of pride, he was thrown out of heaven because he wanted to set himself up against God. Because he started to believe that he could be God, God had to throw him out of, out of heaven. In the Genesis account with Adam and Eve, we see that Satan comes with pride to Adam and Eve. And when they, t when they recount to him, we can't eat that fruit or we'll die, he says, no, no, you won't die. You'll become like God. It's pride that causes the first sin. Pride that allows sin to enter the world and pride that lives inside all of us and causes us to go away from God's perfect plan for our life, causes us to sin, causes us to do wrong. Deep within us, all of us, have a me first attitude. And I'm sorry if that seems harsh, but please know that everything that I say over the next half hour is true for me first. I am full of pride. I confess it before you this morning, I struggle with pride. I struggle with pride as I prepare to preach because I wonder what everyone will think of me. And that's pride. I struggle with pride as I get up in the morning and I think about what I look like. It's pride. It's pride that, that asks the question, what will people think? And so deep inside of me, I recognize and I know that I battle with pride and my belief, my conviction, and I believe what the Bible says is that that is true of every human being who has ever lived. Pride is our first battle. We have to deal with pride. And as we come to the crossroads, as we come to the place of the skull this morning, we're going to look at three groups of people, all of whom are dealing with pride, all of whom are struggling with pride. And the first group of people are the total crooks, the thieves, one on the left and one on the right of Jesus. And this series hangs around their conversation with Jesus, so we're going to look at them this morning. They are the total crooks. The second group, group of people are the by the books. They are the leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the people who do everything right. That's the second group of people. And the third group of people we're going to look at this morning are the try not to looks. They're the people who are walking past, trying not to be drawn into what's happening on the cross, trying not to be caught up in what's, what's outfolding before them, the try not to looks. The total crooks, the by the books, the try not to looks. We're going to look at all three and see how they're dealing with pride and how pride outworks in their lives in this scene on the cross 2,000 years ago. Because I believe there's things in each one of those groups of people that also live within me and may therefore also live within all of us. The total crooks, the thieves. The Bible tells us that they're pouring scorn on Jesus insulting him, abusing them. And you might wonder, when you have got to the point in your life where you have been convicted of a crime and nailed to a tree to die, what is the value of trying to bring anyone even lower? Let me tell you, the motivator for that is pride. I may be low, but I can still make someone else lower. 
It's pride that says I'm going to center myself, lift myself up a little bit, even if it means crushing you even further. It's pride that outworks in the two thieves on the cross. And I know that we read in Luke 23 that one hurled insults and the other gives his life to Jesus. But in Matthew and Mark, we see that actually that's a bit later on in the story. Both the thief on the left and the right were busy insulting and hurling abuse on Jesus as, they sat, as he hung on the cross. What level of pride would you have to have in your heart to behave like that? I would put it to you that we see it. We see it in our world when bullies and trolls choose to pick on people, choose to put people down to make themselves feel better, choose to undermine people. And I hope and I trust that those behaviors aren't behaviors that we would see in our own lives, but we can recognize them. We know what it's like. We know what, we know what that looks like when somebody says, I may be low, but I can make you even lower. I can insult you and make you less. So the total crooks are operating in disgust and insult, trying somehow to identify someone who they can make even worse off than them. What about the, by the books? The teachers, the Pharisees, the rulers of the law, those who actually, by their actions and by their petition to Herod and Pilate, have put Jesus in this place. And they stand back and they look at Jesus and the Bible tells us they sneer at him. And they pour scorn upon him. And they say, that placard above your head says you are the king of the Jews. Come on then. Save yourself. Save yourself. The derision. The contempt. The misguided view that I'm okay. I've got my life together. And that person, they're the wretch. They're the mess. They're the problem. Can you see that in the by the books? Can you see that behavior in them? More importantly, can we recognize that behavior in ourselves? Have we ever behaved like that? Surely not. It's interesting when you read all the gospels, we see that this behavior is the behavior that Jesus has the most trouble with. Out of all the behaviors that Jesus encounters in his 30 years on earth, the one that he really zeroes in on is the people who practice hypocrisy, who claim to be better than everyone else. In fact, his words are, you are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of rotten corpses. He can't stand it. Jesus cannot stand hypocrisy. And you know, I do this whenever I categorize wrongdoing. Whenever I categorize sin, whenever I make a list in my mind and say, these sins here, they're tolerable, and these ones here, they're beyond the pale. This is the stuff that's really bad. But this stuff, all the stuff I do, it's all right. This is the stuff that really winds God up. That's false. That list doesn't exist. That list has no place, but it comes from pride. Because pride wants to say, I may not be perfect, but at least I'm not like them. I may not have it all together, but at least I don't do that. I maybe watch a little bit of porn, but I never cheat on my wife. I maybe think the odd angry thought, but I've never punched anybody. And we come to the Bible and we come to Jesus and we hear him say, you think a lustful thought, you've committed infidelity. You call someone a fool, you might as well have murdered them. And the Bible says to us, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And we have to recognize that as soon as we do the, ah, well, there's a category, we're falling into pride. We're falling into pride. And church, I just want to say to you, this is one of our biggest challenges, not necessarily as a local church, but as the church as a whole. Because pride is endemic within all of us, because it lives in all of us, and all of us have this natural desire to want to categorize sin, we, even sometimes without knowing it, can make church a place that is inaccessible for people who are struggling with certain things. Because we say, that's not my struggle, therefore it must be worse than, or it's good for me for it to be worse than, and we need to repent of that church. 
we need to repent of that and acknowledge that all of us have pride within us. All of us have different sins that we battle with. And God's grace is enough for every single sin. We'll come on to that in a minute. <clears throat> We've got the total crooks. I may be low, but you can be lower. We've got the by the books. I'm all right. I've got my life together. You're the mess. And we've got the try not to looks. The people who try to turn away to avoid the pain don't want to get sucked into it. And you might say to me, well, that doesn't sound like pride to me. Let me put to you that it is always pride. It is a me-centered approach when I try to shield myself from others' pain. When I try to shield myself from the reality that others are living. When I protect and prioritize my world, my circle, my family, my household, my well-being, my wealth, my whatever, at the expense of others, I am putting me first, and that is a prideful attitude. And what the people who pass by and try to turn away from the cross are doing is they're saying by their actions, by their engagement, I don't need that to interfere with my life. I don't need that to interfere with my well-being. And church, I have to confess before you that I'm guilty of this. My wife Lynn is a social worker and when she was doing her probation year, I've told this story before, when she was doing her probation year, she was based with the children and families team up in Peterhead. And she dealt day to day with children within half an hour's drive of my home whose lives were unimaginably, unimaginably difficult. And she would come home and she would carefully, protecting all confidentialities, download on me what she'd gone through in the day. And I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to let that into my world because the pain would shatter my comfortable existence. That's pride in me. It's pride in me that says, don't, let, don't bring your pain into my world because I want to protect my world first. Can you see how that's pride? And the reality for these three groups of people, the total crooks, the by the books, and the try not to looks, is that they are blinded by the pride that lives within them. They are blinded by the pride that lives within them. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. You cannot see something that is above you. So how do we deal with pride? The truth is revealed in humility. The truth is revealed in humility. Let's look at our characters again. The total crook, we see in Luke 23 that something shifts in him. Something shifts in him in this verse, in this recounting of the story, from what we've seen him doing in Matthew and Mark. He's heaping abuse onto Jesus. And then by the time we get to Luke 23, he says to the other chap who's on the cross with him, he says, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's seen something inside himself. He's had a revelation somehow. In that time when he is hanging on the cross, he's had a revelation of the condition of his own soul. Because he says, we're getting what we deserve here. We're getting what we deserve. That's a big statement, isn't it? That's not a statement that most of us would want to make. And I appreciate that most of you in the room and online you maybe haven't been convicted or accused of a crime, and certainly, as far as I know, nobody is on death row. But to be able to say, this is what I deserve, is an incredible statement of humility. And it's not a statement that most of us would make very readily. But it's a statement that all of us have to be able to make when we look honestly at the condition of our own souls. To be able to look inside and say, like the hymn writer said, I am a wretch. I am a wretched, wretched person. I am full of pride. These are my words for me. I'm not trying to put them onto you. I am full of pride. I hate the way I think. I hate my tendency towards action, my misdeeds, my missteps, my unkindness. I am full of 
things that I wish weren't there. And the truth that I have to be able to declare is if it weren't for Jesus, what I would deserve would be death. That is the penalty for sin. That's what the Bible says. It says, because of everything that's inside of me, the way I behave, the way I am, I deserve to die. And that honest inward look is the first step in the revelation of humility. It's the step that the total crook on the cross is able to take when he says, we are getting what we deserve. We are getting what we deserve. But in his next breath, he has the revelation of who he is. And in his next breath, he has the revelation of who Jesus is hanging on the cross next to him. Because then he says, but this man is better. This man is different. This man has done nothing wrong. And that in itself is a revelation of humility because it takes a lot for me to admit that other people are better than me, even that Jesus is better than me. You know, sometimes so, so I want to present to everybody I meet, I want to present like my life is reasonably well put together. I don't want to bump into you in the street and have you quickly identify me as someone who is falling apart. But over the last few weeks, I'm going to be honest with you, my body has let me down badly because I am one of those people who's prone to styes. You know, like when you get an infection on your eyelid? And what it is, is it's my face letting me down. It's my face, because what I want to do is I want to tell you all I'm all right. And when I say I'm fine, I want you to believe me. I've got this massive flashing light going off over here going, he's not fine at all. This guy's a wreck. That's what it does. And people who know me come up to me and go, are you okay? You're stressed. I'm like, <clears throat> you're right, I am. And I wish you couldn't see it. I wish you couldn't see it because I don't want, I don't want to own my weakness. I don't want you to know how weak I am. I want you to believe that what, what I present is what I am. And then my face lets me down. I got spots on my chin as well. For goodness sake, I'm 40 this year. <laughs> Shouldn't happen. Anyway, hang on while I go repent. Right, we're back. But my face let me down. Gave away my weakness. The fact that actually, sometimes I feel like I'm barely keeping my head above water. I feel like I'm running to stand still. I'm not sleeping enough, I'm tired, I'm grumpy, I'm stressed, I'm not doing well. And I would love to hide it, but my face gave it away, so I might as well just tell you all. I haven't got it as together as you maybe think I do. But Jesus is better. Jesus is better. So if I can acknowledge my weakness, and then I can acknowledge his strength, and I can acknowledge that I am weak, but he is strong. He is so much better. So much better than me. In every single way, he is better than me. And I, he carries me and he holds me. And believe you me, he is with me on this platform this morning because if he wasn't, I'd be a quivering wreck. Jesus is better. And the crook sees it and says, he's different. That man there is different. So the revelation of humility is first, how much of a wretch and a mess am I? And then, how glorious and how perfect is Jesus? And once we have them, once we have those revelations of humility, then there's a third revelation that comes hot on the heels of the first two. And it's this. It's the revelation of who others are. Because once I realize who I am and how much of a mess I am, and I realize how much better Jesus is, then the revelation that comes is that every single human being I ever meet is made in the image of God and loved by God exactly the same way that God loves me. And every single person is crafted and cared for and the delight of almighty God. And that changes everything. That changes everything in how I behave, in how I carry myself and how I interact with people. And it's so easy for pride to keep in and say, creep in and say, oh, well, we're all the same, of course, but I've made better decisions. Grace. I've made better decisions, maybe, by God's grace. 
It is by God's grace that all of us in this room are in the northeast of Scotland where there is a reasonable healthcare service and social protection and there is clean water that comes out of our taps and there is electricity, it is God's grace. And we can point back to the decisions we've made and the discipline we've put in and everything else and I might take you down my story and say, well, maybe I have a home and a family and a job because of the decisions I've made and everything else. But those decisions... And those privileges came because by the grace of God, he, I was born to parents who loved Jesus. And by the grace of God, he wired me up the way I am. And by the grace of God, he has given me everything that I have. And there is nothing in my life that I can't point at and say that is God's grace to me. And I have to. Because as soon as some of it belongs to me, the OG is back. Pride is back saying, well, that was you, Craig, you did that. You did that, and you deserve, you deserve what you've got because you've worked hard for it, God's grace. Grace, 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 grace. Do not let there be anything in your life that you do not point at and say that is the grace and the kindness of God to me. It's the single biggest tool for dismantling pride. The single biggest tool is to look at every good thing that you have in your life, everything that you've got, and say, thank you, God, for your grace and your kindness on my life. If you are somebody who's studying to get your PhD, well done you, God's grace. God's grace. If you're somebody who runs your own business, well done you, God's grace. God's grace. We have to learn this because this is how we learn to treat others because we recognize that the thing The difference, if there is a difference between me and you is God's grace. And he's poured grace out on me and he wants to pour grace out on you. And if I have have a, a surplus, then my job is to let that overflow to you. Does that make sense? The revelation of humility is who I am, it's who Jesus is, and it's who others round about me are. And the total crook, he sees this. He sees this. And he recognizes it on the cross. And in this interaction with Jesus, he says, wow, I am a sinner. But that man hanging on the cross next to me, he's not. He's different. He's better. He's blinded by pride. Revealed by humility. And then we come to this moment where all three categories of people that we've talked about react to what they've seen and to the journey they've been on at the place of the skull. And they're saved by faith. Salvation happens at Golgotha, at the place of the skull. People who are blinded by pride have a revelation of humility and are saved by faith. Let me tell you, the total crook, he sees who he is. He recognizes that Jesus is better And he asks, he asks Jesus a simple question. Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? If you're within the sound of my voice this morning, I want to say to you that that is the only question you need to ask. Jesus, would you remember me? Would you remember me? It's a question that needs humility. Because first you have to acknowledge that you need to be remembered. First you have to acknowledge that there's something in you that isn't right. There's a need. And then you can come to Jesus and say, Jesus, please, would you remember me? And the promise that comes back from Jesus to the crook on the cross is I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It's amazing. A phenomenal transformation of this man who is hanging, bleeding out on a cross, unable to breathe. The method of crucifixion was so cruel that people literally asphyxiated to death because they couldn't raise themselves up enough to draw oxygen into their lungs. And their final cause of death most of the time would be asphyxiation. So when you, everything you read on the cross, every word that's said from the cross, whether it's the thieves or whether it's Jesus, that word is precious. Because whoever said it only had enough breath 
to say those words. That's why when we looked at them hurling insults on him, you think, guys, honestly, this is the breath that you have and you use it to insult a man in the same condition as you. But fast forward and here he is and he uses his breath, his final breath to say, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus uses his to say, I tell you the truth. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. The total crook asks, the by the books, sadly, we don't hear a story of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law having a revelation of humility at the cross. We don't hear that in the gospel account. We don't know if it happened or not. But we do know one thing. In the latter part of the passage that I read earlier, there's a centurion. The centurion is one of the by the books. He's a man of power, a man of influence. He's got a hundred troops who report to him. He's the man who has taken charge of this execution, who has commanded the soldiers as they led the condemned up the hill to die, who has set out the points where the crosses go and tasked the work parties to drive the nails through the arms and through the feet of those who are being crucified. He is the man who has stood and has watched as his soldiers offered the vinegar on the sponge up towards Jesus. He is the man who has given the command to drive the spear between the ribs and the water and the blood have flown out. This man, the by the book, so much pride within him that he could oversee this crucifixion, witnesses Jesus' death watches as the sun disappears and the middle of the day turns to night. Hears the rip from the temple as the veil is torn in two. Feels the earth shake beneath him and declares, surely this is the Son of God. What a transformation. The centurion, his pride laid low by witnessing Jesus, witnessing the power of our King hanging on the cross. And his declaration is a declaration of truth. This is the Son of God. The crook asks, the by the book declares, and my last one's maybe not quite fair, because for the try not to look category, I want to bring John and Mary in. If they were trying not to look, the Bible tells us that they were there at the foot of the cross as Jesus was crucified. If they were trying not to look, it would have been because of the agony of witnessing what Jesus was going through. But they're there. And remember how precious every breath is from the cross. And the Gospel of John tells this story says that Jesus, with some of his final breaths, and some of you, some of you have sat with people as they approach death, and they try to say things, and our natural tendency is to say, shh, it's okay, keep your breath to yourself. It's okay, you don't need to speak. And as Jesus dies, he summons some of his final agonizing breaths to look down at John and to look at his mum and to say to John, John, here's your mum. Look after her. Care for her. Take care of, your, take care of my mum. Make her your mum. And here's what happens. The Bible tells us that John obeys. From that moment on, John took Mary and made her his mum. Looked after her. Cared for her. I think it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. These three crowds of people, and all of them, let's be fair to John and Mary, but certainly the crooks and the by the books, blinded by pride, can't see what's happening in front of them. But by the end of the story, they've asked Jesus to remember them. They've come to that point of declaring this is the son of God 
and they're able to obey and do what he asks them to do. And for all of us, as we stand at the crossroads, we have to look inwards and recognize that we're riddled by pride. We have to have a revelation of humility. This is who I am. This is who Jesus is. This is who everybody else is. And then we have to come to that place of decision. Will I ask? Will I ask Jesus to be my Lord, my Savior, and my King? Will I declare? Will I use my voice to say this is who he is? The Bible says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. We declare. These people are going to go into the tank in a minute. They're going to declare. I have decided Jesus is my king. And will we obey? Will we bow the knee and do what he tells us to do? Humble ourselves, lay down our me first attitudes and say, Jesus, if you tell me to take this woman to be my mother, I'll do it. If you tell me to go across the world to another nation, I'll do it. If you tell me to walk across my office to declare your name to my colleague, I'll do it. Whatever you need, Lord Jesus. I'm not going to be blinded by pride. I'm going to live in humility and I'm going to obey what you call me to do. We're going to take a moment just now and respond. So why don't you bow your head? Across this room and online, I know. Guys, I've spent the week responding to this message. I'm still responding to it as I stand in front of you. I told you right at the very start, I am riddled by pride. Riddled by it. I hope I'm not unique. I don't believe that I am. But there are responses for all of us to make. And the first one that I want to make is for you, if you're here today, and you've never actually asked Jesus to remember you, and you've never actually declared Jesus is my king, and today as you sit in this room, something's happening inside of you and you're saying, I don't want to be in this place anymore. I want to be the other side of that declaration. I want to know that Jesus is my king. If inside of your heart, that's what's happening, and you're saying, I just want to know that Jesus is my king. I recognize the mess of my own life. I recognize that he is better and I want to accept him. Then would you just put your hand up right now nice and high and one of the team will see it. Just put your hand up wherever you're at. Praise God. Praise God. For all of us, all of us have got pride to deal with. All of us have got to choose humility and die to ourselves. So before Callum comes to lead us through these next few moments, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray for myself, for my pride. And I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge. I acknowledge my sin. Pride keeps creeping in. And Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, 24th of March, I humble myself again. I look inward and recognize I'm full of sin. I look up to you and acknowledge that you are better. You are different. You are holy. And I confess that I need you. Help me, Lord Jesus, every day to die to myself and to live to you. I love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.